Hey guys, it's Boy Chill here. Welcome back to STD Gems. Today's topic is minimum maximum operations and comparison operations. These are two kind of light sections, so I decided to lump them together. They're kind of similar as well. They have to do with comparisons. Uh, and uh, it's good news. This is the second last video in this leg of the STD Gems, right? The algorithm stuff. Because after this one, we've already done permutations. We just have numeric operations and we're all done. This stuff here isn't really algorithm type stuff. I, I consider it uh, different. So it's been quite a journey here going through all these. But uh, yeah, we're almost done. And then we can move on to other interesting things in the standard library. So max, min, you guys have seen me use this before if you've ever watched any of my other series. It's an essential operation. And it couldn't be any simpler, right? I mean, you get yourself two values. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, there we go. And then we go auto min is equal to std min x y and it is going to give you the smaller of the two things you pass in, which is obviously going to be two. I mean, there should be no mystery there, right? And you, you can understand that max is just, you know, the opposite thing It's going to give you the bigger of the two. And I mean, this kind of operation, you use it all the freaking time. Like, for example, you do some calculation. Uh, and you're going to use that calculation as an index, but you don't want an index in the negative uh, numbers. So you're going to do max with your calculated result in zero. And therefore, if your calculated result is a negative, you're never going to go below zero. And we can see here, there's a bunch of versions of stidmin, and it's the same for stidmax. Uh, doesn't shouldn't surprise you that there's a version that allows you to pass in a custom comparator to do a comparison function that isn't just invoking the less than operator between these two. Uh, but there's also one here that takes an initializer list, so you're not, you haven't seen me use this one, but uh, you're not limited to just two things if you use an initializer list. So I can do something like this, and when I step over it's going to give me the maximum of these three values in here in the initializer list. And you can mix, you know, compile time constants with uh, runtime variables, that's no issue. So that's min max, you can, you know, find the minimum maximum between two values or between a number of values in a fixed list. But what about a uh, like in a vector? I want to find the biggest value in a vector, or the smallest. Well, in that case, you're going to use max element and min element. And they just accept a range, right? So you get iterated to the beginning and the end, and you can find the biggest element or the smallest element in that range. And there's versions for uh, you can pass in a uh, comparator. There's also execution policy versions, and I, we will get into that uh, in a future video coming up very soon. You might be wondering, what's the uh, difference between, you know, running std max on an initializer list and running uh, std max element on a vector? And the answer is, uh, initializer list, the number of elements in it is going to be statically fixed at compile time, whereas a vector, number of elements in it can be dynamic. And if you actually look into the implementation, I believe usually std max on an initializer list just runs std max element on the initializer list using the begin and end functions. So it's all it's all connected, right? But let's do std max uh, element. Looks like that. We expect a uh, one three three seven in our max, and we get a one three three seven. So I mean, this shouldn't be too complicated if you're familiar with ranges, and you should be at this point. And that's max, max element, min, min element in a nutshell. Not that hard. Now there's also min max. I don't use this one as much, but it can come in handy. It follows a very similar pattern to max and min. You've got a normal version and an element version. But if you look at the, uh, the signatures here, we can see we got a little bit of difference now because it's not returning a single value t. It's returning a pair. Min max you give it two values and it will give you those two values back. And you might be saying, what's the point of that? Well, it gives you the minimum in the first value and the maximum in the second value. So it's basically a two value sort, which is a situation that comes into play more often than you might think. If you think back or if you guys have ever watched my uh, 3D fundamental series, you'll see that I do sorting between two values quite often here or sorting between three values by sorting uh, two values three times here. And uh, that was used for the rasterization of triangles to get the vertices in the correct order. You also see me sorting two values when I was teaching inheritance in the meme fighter to make sure that the uh, the fighter with priority takes its action first. 
I would take the parameters in and then I would sort the two parameters. And that's the sort of thing you can do with min max. And of course, there's also a version that takes initializer list and then it will scan through all the values in the list and it'll give you the smallest value and the biggest value. So here's a basic example. We're going to run min max or get the return value auto. This is going to be a pair. We can print out the first, which is the minimum, second, which is the maximum. And we run this, we see it prints out 42, 69. Makes perfect sense, right? Now pairs are nice and convenient, but they're also kind of uh, cancerous for the readability of your code because first, second, it doesn't describe like, what is that? Doesn't really make a lot of sense. So what we can do here is we can use a little magic from C++17, I believe. And uh, we can destructure that into two new variables, min and max. And now the code becomes a lot more readable. That's beautiful, right? So I definitely recommend if you're taking uh, pairs in destructuring them like this, it's often going to lead to a lot more readable code. And min-max element works exactly like you would expect. I'm not going to go over it in detail. It's just, you know, it returns a pair, the biggest and the smallest value across that entire range that you pass in with iterators. So that's that. Now, there's a, uh, a little bit of an issue here that we got to discuss, something that you have to be aware of. And that is, if you look at this here, uh, min-max takes in its parameters by const reference. That's perfectly normal. But it returns its parameters also by reference. So it returns a pair that contains two references. And that's a little interesting. But if you think about it, it makes sense. Because if it returned by value, which is normally what you would want, except what if your T type, what if it doesn't support copying, then you would not be able to use min, max, min, max with uh, those types because you can't copy, right? But if it returns by reference, it can be used even with types that cannot be copied. And also, even if a type can be copied, sometimes you don't want to copy that type because it might be huge. So returning by reference is objectively the best way to implement this, but it does come with a little caveat. So here we can capture by uh, auto min max, and this is going to be by value. So it's going to return a reference. And then from that reference, it will copy into min and max. What if we make min and max references? Well, we'll see that it actually works perfectly fine. Let me just step over this here and we look at the thing. Yeah, 42, 69. That's fine. Um, what that means now is that min is actually referencing y and max is actually referencing x now. What if instead of using x and y directly in here, uh, we use x plus 100 and y plus 100. So this is going to create temporary results that are going to get passed in. And there's going to be a reference to those results. It's going to do the min max. It's going to return references to those temporaries, but those temporaries will be destroyed after this line. They won't exist anymore. So the end result here is that this is undefined behavior. You can't predict, you can't uh, expect the correct result to come out of this. Now it turns out that if I run this code, in this case here, we actually do get the correct result. And that could be because those temporaries, maybe they were on the stack, uh, maybe we're referencing them on the stack and they have gone out of scope, but nothing has overwritten them yet. Or who knows what it is. It's undefined behavior is the, the point. So the moral of the story is that if you're doing stuff where you have temporaries that are being passed into min-max, don't capture the result by reference and you'll be safe. Just to be clear, that's not just for min-max, that's for min as well. You see here it returns const reference to t. But it doesn't apply to the max element, min element, as you can see, because they return iterators. So it's not an issue. All right, now the last guy in this section here, clamp, is something that uh, I've wanted in C++ for a long time. And I was wondering, why don't they have this? And it's pretty simple. You give it a value and then you give it the, uh, the minimum and the maximum that you want, the allowed range, and it will clamp V to that range. So let's say the range is from zero to one. So we do std clamped and let's say I've got a V and it is you know 1.5 and I want to clamp it from 0 to 1 that's not clamped it's clamp and we can see that it has saturated to 1 1.5 is greater than the allowed maximum so it peaks at this maximum and if I were to put this to negative 1.5 then it's going to saturate to 0 but if I put it within the allowed range let's say 0 0.45 we're going to see 
yeah, I mean, there's, it's floating point representation error here, but you can see, yeah, it's 0 0.45. And this is very useful in a bunch of things. You often see it in shaders when you're doing calculations, colors and stuff, the results can go without outside of the, the normal color range of 0 to 1, and then you want to clamp it to that range. And again, same thing applies here. It's all with references, so just uh, be careful when binding to the, out, the output reference. When possible, you just want to uh, take that by value. All right, that's this section done here. Minimal, maximum operations. Not too complicated, very simple. Just watch out for that reference binding. Uh, comparison operations, not a big deal. Um, equal just compares two ranges. Pass in two ranges of iterators, it will tell you if those ranges are equal. If you actually look at the uh, documentation for equal, we see, holy crap, there's a lot of overloads. But uh, half of them, are using execution policies. We'll cover that in uh, probably two videos from now. Uh, the other the other part is there are versions that take a full range and then just the start iterator of the second range. So it will iterate over the second range. It just assumes the length of the second range is equal to the length of the first range. So it doesn't need the out uh, the end iterator for the second range. But there's also a version that takes the full range of both of them. So input. Uh, iterators for the first and the second range, beginning to end. And then there's also versions that take a custom predicate, which is basically the comparator. So there are a lot of combinations of options, but basically there's just two, two things. Is the second range a full range? And do you have a custom comparator? Those are the two main things. Uh, execution policy, like I said, we'll cover that later. So just a simple test, we got two vectors, A, B, and then we got another one, C, A, and B. They have the same elements. C, the elements are a little bit different, and if we run this stuff, we'll see that A and B, they are equal, but A and C are not equal. And that's all there is to it. Not that complicated. Could perhaps come in handy. The last one we're going to look at here, lexicographical compare, that's just a, a $20 word, which means, you know, you're asking which one would come before the other in the dictionary. You know, in the dictionary, um, words that start with A become come before words that start with B, right? But within the words that start with A, the words that start with A, if the second letter is an A, it's going to come before a word where the second letter is a B, right? Uh, and you might be saying, well, what about things that aren't letters? I mean, in, I, I've, I've said this, everything's a freaking number, right? So it doesn't matter. Um, for a lexicographical compare here, let's take these two uh, sequences here. First two elements are the same, okay. Second two are the same, okay. Third one, different. This one after this one, so that means that A should come after C, and you don't even need to look at the rest of them, it doesn't matter. This is the first place where there's a difference, and this one is after this one. Okay? So, we should expect... Let's do this. Did lexicographical compare, and uh, it appears as though all the versions of lexicographical compare, they require two full ranges. So, uh, let's let's get to typing. Oh, I can't wait for std ranges. It's going to be glorious. But anyways, here we go. All right. So we got the full ranges here. Now, what does it say? So it checks if the first range is lexicographically less than the second range. So this should be a false because this one, A, should come after C. That's my understanding of how this should work. I'll run it. And yeah, it's, it's a big old false. What happens if we make this one a three? Let's run it again. Now it's a true. All right, there you go. There you have it. Lexicographical compare. And now you have all these bad boys. We've covered them. And uh, it's good. It's good to go. That's going to do it for this video. Stay tuned for the next one. We are going to wrap up our look into the STID algorithms library. We're going to look at the, the last few functions in the numerics category. And then I will have covered everything that I want to cover in STID algorithm. And after that, we're going to look at how you can actually uh, parallelize those algorithms very simply by using execution policies. So, fun stuff coming up in the future. Until then, thanks for watching. Hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please click the like button. Helps a lot. And I will see you soon with some more STD gems.